Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Uh, my name is James Hayden. I'm the, the Chair of Faculty, uh, Vice Provost for Social Sciences. I'm quite new in the role, actually, and I have to think very carefully about what my own job title is at the moment. It hasn't quite come naturally yet. But I, I've got the great uh, pleasure of introducing our speaker for this evening. And uh, I'm on strict instructions to keep it brief, uh, no puffery. Um, and it's, it's ironic because I found out in the process of, of, sort of talking to Andrew how much we've got in common uh, and how many common interests we have in terms of uh, human behavior, but also in terms of our, our backgrounds in, in terms of institutions and so on. So I could launch into a, a hopefully a, a diatribe on the, the value of working in an institution that, that gives you room to, to do interesting things, but I won't. Uh, because I don't want to take up all of the airtime. Uh, but I, I do want to give the few words uh, I need to, to, to Andrew, a world-renowned uh, economist who's known for his groundbreaking work uh, that overlaps between labor economics and behavioral science and has really uh, launched this, this area of interest in the economics of well-being. Uh, which I know so many scholars have followed and, and found uh, interesting and indeed also within the, the Warwick Business School as well as the Economics Department. Um, he's been a professor of economics and behavioral science at the University of Warwick since 1996 and has consequently made significant contributions to our understanding of the relationship between work and happiness, uh, the determinants of job satisfaction, uh, which is another area we, we, we have an interest in, a common interest in, and of course the economics of mental health. His work is very highly regarded, not only for the empirical rigor, uh, but also the implications that it has for public policy and of course for individual well-being. Um, and really significantly for the institution, it's not just about the, the, the academic influence, but also the influence on governments on policy, advising on labor markets and on, on uh, issues around human well-being. Uh, and so I think that we have great pride in our colleagues who are able to make an impact, not just intellectually and as academics, but also on the field of, of practice and policy. It's of significant importance to, to us as an institution uh, in terms of making our impact on the world. Uh, so thank you, Andrew. Please uh, welcome Andrew Oswald. Uh, for the uh, discussion around societal unhappiness and the uncertain future of democracy. Whoever said it was a dismal science, Andrew? <laughs> well, good afternoon. How very kind of you to come on a beautiful sunny day. I wouldn't have blamed you if you'd sat in the sunshine. This is a man called Turchin, Peter Turchin. He's a distinguished mathematical zoologist who's worked mainly in the United States and in Austria. He's made significant contributions to the study of phenomena such as so-called predator-prey cycles in zoology. And at a certain point in his career, Peter Turchin got interested in whether his ways of thinking and his empirical methods might be applied usefully to the study of cycles and conflict in human society. Very fleetingly, in the journal Nature in 2010, and then at much greater length in 2012, Peter Turchin predicted um, a whole bunch of years uh, before, as you can see, that in 2020, the United States would be subject to extreme political conflict and upheaval. Well, Turchin turned out to be wrong, but only by six days. <laughs> If you're anywhere approaching my age, and hardly anybody in the room appears to be, um, it's, uh, this would have been absolutely inconceivable. I first went to America in the 1980s, and if somebody had said to me that in my lifetime this could have happened, it would have been uh, absurd. Yet, yet, of course, we know that really quite recently it did. Uh, Peter Turchin very kindly has communicated with me about some of his work and he sent me a slide that I think is very interesting. I don't believe the slide is widely known. So I'm going to show you a time series from roughly the end of the Second World War on anti-government demonstrations in a whole bunch of prominent countries, including ours, 
and the United States. And this is what the time series on anti-government demonstrations look like. This is um, 1940, approximately, as it were, if it could start that early. It runs up to a little bit short of 2020. Now, there's lots of variation, and there's lots of wiggles in these diagrams, in this diagram as the, the lines go along. But you can see that around 2010, if you're at the back, that may be quite small font, but it's around 2010 when we see a, a dramatic, and I think it would be fair to say, approximately speaking, concerted spike up across these important countries. Now, Turchin's work emphasizes a, a number of causal factors that created those spikes, and I'm afraid will almost certainly impinge very, very seriously on the lives of everybody in the room, but particularly the younger people. He emphasizes inequality as a risk factor for conflict and revolution. He emphasizes so-called youth bulge, there seems a little bit of a youth bulge in this room, but I'm happy about that. A youth bulge in the population because uh, young people are more radical, they're, they're more likely to object. And in history, of course, um, a large number of young people can be part of revolutions. They don't tend to start them in such a direct way, and we'll come on to that. But a, a key feature in, in um, his work is what he calls elite overproduction. And ladies and gentlemen, you are looking at an elite overproducer at the front, and there's an awful lot of those in the audience. And the term means just exactly what you might think. That is, he worries that, and his equations support this, of course, that we're filling up society with lots and lots of people who believe that they are select elites, and they've done these exams, but that ultimately there won't be the wages that they might aspire to or the positions that they might hope to attain. So elite overproduction, unusual term, but I think it's particularly interesting, figures strongly in his predictive models. So let's think about the United States. I have a William Hill betting account. I don't know whether the chair of economics who's in the front here has any idea I have a William Hill betting account, but I mainly use it to, to, I mainly use it to um, look at the, the political odds. It's extremely useful. And in case you, you might be inclined to look down on that, um, I want to remind you that the odds on these bookies are fixed by the international weight of money. And we are talking about huge sums of money being bet on this election, of course, on both sides. And a few days ago, I checked today, it's exactly the same. Trump is the leader. Biden is slightly behind, and Michelle Obama, technically, though miles behind, is, um, is third. Behind that lies a, a fascinating, to me, Gallup survey in 2020. I don't know how many people here have ever heard of this, but for some years, not since 2020, this is the last year, what man you've heard of anywhere in the world do you most admire? This is a random sample of Americans. Can you guess? It's that man. That's the majority view. That was the majority view in 2020 of the most admired man they felt in, in the world. Another uh, really, I think, terribly interesting survey is done by Chapman University every year. Not many people know about this. And it presents a random sample of America. It's not that big a sample by my standards, maybe two and a half thousand. But the sampling seems to be very carefully done. It presents a random sample of Americans with a whole list of things. Tell me which of these you're very afraid of. Okay, and they get to choose. I doubt if you could guess what comes as their top fear. I could not. And I think it's a tremendously um, evocative and, and interesting insight into American society. Um, high up is nuclear war. You know, these people are not crazy. My family becoming ill. Uh, international terrorism, but the thing that comes top of it all in Americans' greatest fears is corrupt government officials. See, I think that's very important to know if we're thinking about whether democracy will last in this very important country and beyond. And just if you're interested, 7% of Americans give the answer, I am very afraid of, are you ready for this? Zombies. <laughs> 
Now, initially I clipped in, sort of for local colour, you might say, a, a nasty, frightening movie picture from uh, some zombie. But this one, I thought it was too depressing. But this, these little girls caught my eye, and I couldn't help thinking that the young lady in the middle could imagine a speech bubble coming out. Why on earth did my parents put me in this movie? And the little girl on her right, my left, is taking the job so seriously, I think she will go for that youngster. Um, so what is happening uh, inside um, society in this extremely important country? Of course, um, unless you haven't looked at a newspaper or the TV or social media in the last five years, you, you must know very extreme emotions are involved here. And, and scientifically, as well as practically, that's actually extremely interesting and I don't entirely understand it. If you can't read this latest T-shirt, it says, talking to you reminds me to clean my gun. And just in case there's not enough punch to that sentence, the word gun is underlined. Um, I'll show you data now from two articles published in the American Journal of Public Health. These are essentially data on men mental ill health or extreme mental distress in US society. We'll look at the, the top end of distress and then at distress for the average American citizen. So this is based on about 8 million randomly sampled Americans. This comes from something called the BRFSS data set run by the CDC, the Center for Disease Control. About 360,000 Americans are randomly sampled every year and have been since the 90s. <coughs> And here's, um, here's one of the questions. This is what I'm going to show you. For how many days during the past 30 was your mental health not good? And initially I'll show you the, the really extreme tale. Those who answer every day of my life. All 30 out of 30. The vast majority of Americans say zero days. Of course, to this question. They, they report no men, bad mental health days. But we'll look at the, uh, the tales. So... Um, that's, um, if you know nothing about this kind of America, I've driven around a lot, I'd, um, I'd recommend it to you. So this will be time series graph from 93 to 2019, just before the pandemic. This is the proportion of Americans suffering extreme distress. Um, women, as usual, on these kinds of measures come higher up than males. And although these graphs don't double, this is proportions. So, of course, we're talking about um, relatively small numbers of, of Americans in, in percentage terms. Of course, it's many, many millions if you do the arithmetic. But um, women go from about 4% of the population to getting on for 7% over the era. And, of course, men do something similar, but at lower, lower levels. Now, I'm going to show you subgroups. Uh, the, these graphs were created by David G. Blanche Flower at Dartmouth in the US, by the way. I'll show you subgroups. This is not the day for lots of technical stuff, and there will be no equations, as far as I can remember. Um, there'll be a few graphs, as you can see. So I'd like you to concentrate on the light blue line, because there's, you know, there's too much for us to go through. But if you look at the light blue line, I think it's particularly interesting. And the light blue line in my opinion, is one of the reasons why Donald Trump was elected. Okay, these are uh, uh, extreme mental distress among the, among the subgroups. So the light blue line, the light blue line is white, no college Americans. White, you could say low education, though they're not necessarily that low. White, no college Americans. That goes from 5% suffering extreme mental distress, reporting extreme mental distress anyway, to um, 11, 11.5%. So that does more than double. That means that if we think about this group, it's actually the, the middle-aged, the prime-age um, people. About one in nine Americans of that kind are reporting every day of my life is a day of bad mental health. About one in nine. Now, why is this happening? Now, very briefly, I'll tell you a story of a, prince, a, a postman I met in Princeton. I, it was my first visit to the United States. I thought I was very sophisticated, but really I didn't know very much about the world. 1983, my young family and I lived on campus. I was teaching. I lived in McGee Apartments, if you've ever been there. 
And one day I got talking to my postman, and he said, Andrew, because we got friendly, he said, uh, this weekend, I'm taking the family to our summer house. And I thought, absolutely no offense here on, for postman, but I thought, wow, this country is so rich that even, I don't mean it in a bad way, even a postman has a summer house. And that is what has changed for white Americans. He was white, you can imagine, in 1983, I'm afraid. Now, the early graphs are for extreme distress. So let's look at the average. I'll go quickly here. This is work by Michael Daly, a talented researcher in Ireland, also in the American Journal of Public Health. You get the idea. And once again, if I look at the subgroups, which is blue for white Americans, uh, that's now registering the highest average distress. How about the world? Thanks to Michael Daly and a young woman called Lucia Macchia, who teaches at City University in uh, London, we now have, very recently in the famous scientific journal PNAS, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, we've got an equivalent for 113 countries. And this is the bit I thought I would show you from that article. I do recommend the article to you. The red line is those who have only elementary education. These are emotional distress scores. I'm not going to describe exactly how they are created, they're st but they're standard. And you see, once again, it's the low education people who are pulling ahead, but in the wrong direction, pulling ahead towards higher and higher mental distress. How about Europe? Uh, Lucia Macchia has also generated uh, last week this interesting diagram. These come from, these data come from uh, a Gallup survey asking people whether they worry a lot. I'm doing no details on this uh, today, if I may, but you get the idea. That's from 2005. There are other troubling markers and some of these, I'm afraid, will be known to you. These are nothing to do in general with graphs. Um, how about if we look at the inequality of wealth in the United States? Now, a standard way to think about that, and not a crazy one, is to, is to make statements and take measures like the top 1% of Americans own 23% of American wealth, or whatever it is. But I think in a democracy, there's something to be said for thinking the other way up, looking at what, how much of the bottom 50%, because they get to vote, how much of the bottom 50% own? And the bottom 50% of Americans now own 1% of the country's wealth. You've got to ask yourself, I see one or two jaws have dropped, whether that is sustainable in a democracy as a long run equilibrium. If you want to know our country, we're closer to 10%. What else might be a concern for democracy? Well, I still remember in 83 going in my first supermarket, I knew nothing about firearms to put it at its mildest, I'd never seen one. And I still remember in the big, the giant grocery store, there under the counter in part of the store were lots of weapons. And there's my three-year-old standing beside me. You know, we've got baked beans here and we've got automatic weapons there. Um, this is active shooter incidents in the United States through time. And I'm sorry to say that you may have heard, although guns weren't involved, there was a tragedy in East London today but not with a firearm. There are more guns in the United States than there are people. What's been happening to levels of trust? Presumably trust is in part a kind of glue. I doubt very much whether I'm the first person to say this. I'm almost certainly plagiarizing someone more, um, more qualified, but if, uh, if trust is a kind of glue, then surely it's important to keep democracy together among other things. And these pictures are quite disastrous, quite honestly, if you don't know them. Public trust in government in the United States. In 1958, this pew, that was the first year, three quarters to maybe 80% of Americans um, trusted government almost always or most of the time, getting on for eight out of 10 citizens. A few years ago, it was less than two in 10 citizens. Trust in others in the United States has followed the same kind of path. This is not the same time period, I'm afraid. How about our country? 
This is a very interesting survey. It started in 1944. Unless you know nothing about history, you would think we had better things to do in 1944. However, somebody uh, created this interesting survey, and about one third of Brits said politicians are, are, are out for themselves. Now two thirds of Brits say politicians are out for themselves. You've, you've got the idea. Uh, feelings lead to actions, of course. That's one of the reasons why we care about feelings, but not the only one. And um, here I give credit to my colleague, uh, Michaela Redoano, in part. Um, this is a paper showing that feelings about your income were an extremely good predictor of voting for Brexit and a better predictor than was your own income. Feelings about your income were a better predictor of voting for Brexit than your actual income. Um, some, some good studies have shown that unhappy people voted for Trump and vote for populist politicians. I'm delighted to say the second of these, um, I think highly of both articles, the second is by a young man called Adam Nowakowski, who wrote a dissertation, an undergraduate dissertation at Warwick, which um, was published as that article. More broadly, I'm sure you know that climate change is uh, in a way hanging over us all. Um, you probably, or at least many people, will not know the natural disasters graph. Here I want to give um, credit to Artisha, Artisha Mohanty, who works at the University of Aberdeen, C.K. Tang in Singapore, and Nick Powdhavi in Singapore. Uh, floods are the red line, storms are the greenish line. But of course, the main thing to observe is that remarkable increase. Now, that's either an illusion, an error created by recording things differently, or it's some kind of concomitant, you might think, of global warming. And currently, I'm involved in some research on trying to work some of that out. Carbon dioxide over a long period. Here's another cheery graph. I'm sorry about this. Um, I've given this talk quite a few times over the last couple of years, and uh, yeah, a few people have said, you, you know, it could have been happier, Andrew. You're supposed to be a happiness bloody expert. Um, this is 1980 up to 2010. Imagine what the, the bar for 2020 is going to be like. Think what happened in 2020. So this is just, uh, just going up and up like a moon rocket, I'm sorry to say. Price inflation, um, and it's important to recall, here, here we're fractionally technical um, for the psychologists and economists in the room, but uh, we know that there's a, there's a tremendous asymmetry in how people feel about gaining income and losing income. Of course, I like to be richer. People like to be richer, and that's what the data show. And the data show that, um, although there's a big scientific debate that I won't go into, that probably it's concave. In other words, um, if I give you more and more income, you get happier, but at a slower rate. But loss aversion is that going down is incredibly painful. If you care about mathematics, you can think about it as a non-differentiability going down. Lastly, Last time I gave this talk, there was no slide on AI. All of these pictures are fake, by the way. This is not Donald Trump being arrested by frightening looking black uh, coated men. And the reason I put this in is that about three days ago, I had a long conversation with a security, an international security expert, and that person, you know, I was chatting and I said, I'm going to give a talk on whether democracy will survive. And that person said, well, the main reason is AI, isn't it? And I, I thought, do you really think that? Yes, the person explained to me what they know, what a lot of the public don't know, and I don't know very fully about what AI can, can now do. But that's, that's another risk factor. Let me think about drawing to a close here. Of course, this, you will appreciate this is a non-technical talk, and I'm interested in... Uh, hearing what people think in open discussion, so I didn't want to drone on too long. I've talked mainly about the US and the UK, although we have seen some uh, data from other countries, but you'll be aware that similar trends seem to exist in, in a lot of uh, prominent nations. 
In my opinion, democracy faces severe difficulties. I never thought I would say this in my lifetime. We have extreme dissatisfaction among some citizens, probably not the people in this room, probably not the people that you go out to the pub with or have at your dinner parties. And of course that disaggregation or separation that we see now in society, that's a problem because the Brexiters don't talk to the non-Brexiters, the Trumpists don't talk to the Democrats and so on. A really a remarkable loss of faith in politicians and quite honestly, I'm not sure we can be blamed for losing faith in politicians given what we've seen. But surely that's deeply corrosive to the lastingness of a democracy. Inequality of a very deep kind, and I'll come back and say one other thing about that. Climate change, of course, infectious diseases, inflation, and lastly, the threat from AI and images that getting us to believe things that are wholly untrue and it will be impossible for us to tell, impossible. Now, non-democracies face a lot of these uh, problems, but of course they have ways of uh, reducing the impact in people's minds, uh, the believability of them and so on in people's minds. They have ways of doing that. So what's the outlook? Did I skip one there? What's the outlook for our grandchildren? This is one of mine, his first encounter with a substance known as candy floss. Um, if you type uh, children and grandchildren of the world into the web, which I once did, um, you get some, some, some fantastic pictures like that. And I have to admit that the lower photograph is orthogonal too, has nothing whatsoever to do with the subject of this talk. But when I saw it, because this is the Bee Gees, in case you don't know, the Bee Gees, they're, all the young people behind you have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, when I saw this picture of the Bee Gees, I thought, yes, that is what my haircut looked like when I was 20. Um, let me give you a personal conceptual point and then summarize um, very briefly and stop. I think the deep issue um, this is my view. Maybe many, many other people have said this. I, I don't think I've heard them say it. It's a very simple point you'll see. Probably many people have said it. I think the really deep issue is the following. The age-old sources of wealth, where prosperity came from, uh, were all over the UK and all over the world. We pulled wealth from the sea. We dug it up in big chunks of different kinds of substances. We grew it in the fields. Although it'd be false to say all of those resources were completely evenly distributed, it would be false to say that. They were very, very substantially widely distributed. The coastline, of course, is long. There are fields everywhere. All sorts of different minerals have been dug from within different parts of the UK. That's the age-old sources of wealth, but, but here's our problem. The new source of wealth is not widely distributed. It's extremely concentrated, not just in clever people, but it is concentrated in outstandingly clever people. In case you don't know, the personal wealth of Mark Zuckerberg is slightly over 120 billion US dollars. I don't see how um, this can change, and therefore I don't see how we can stop um, vast increases in inequality going on and on to a point that I can't um, visualize. I can't visualize society at the end of that in 50 or 100 or 200 years. But the key thing is today's wealth is not pulled from the sea or dug. It comes from the clashing together of elite people's brains. And that is, in a sense, it's highly unequal. The fruits of that are intrinsically highly unequal. So that's a kind of generic point or generic worry that I have for the future. Um, we have to ask ourselves, are these kinds of patterns that we've seen and the patterns particularly in trust for our country in the United States, are those patterns consistent with a sustainable democracy of the kind that we have seen? I find it very difficult to believe they are, but maybe we can hope for the best. 
Um, it's become apparent that we have really a slice of society who are extremely dissatisfied. You probably don't meet very many of them. They're angry, there's frustration, there's fear, there's resentment. This is why Trump's probability of being elected was underestimated, in my opinion, though I had a bet on that to happen personally. And similarly for Brexit, which I also made a small bet win on. Um, these, these groups tend not to reply to representative sample surveys, so that is a problem. We've learned about that difficulty, but um, it was for a while it was difficult to realize that that group, the really extreme group, existed. As a young economist, I went to this place and I was taught whatever you do Andrew you do not study feelings data you do not study data on what people feel now the economists who told me that were eminent talented and usually very decent people almost always men who told me that and they must have known in their own lives that feelings were all that mattered to them if they just thought it through carefully but that's what I was taught. And I think that was, uh, that was a mistake. I think uh, more than any point in my lifetime, and I never expected to be thinking this way or giving such a talk, uh, we need detailed data on these things, and particularly on the notion of falling behind. You probably don't feel that if you're sitting in this lecture theater, but a hell of a lot of citizens, and they all get to vote, and do. And we need to act immediately on that. Um, my personal view is if government had been tracking what we might call feeling data more systematically for a much longer time, then our democracy would not be in the trouble that it is. And I'm sorry to say, I, I do think democracy is in trouble in our kinds of parts of the world. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>
I don't have to think that. And I'm a, a very lucky man. And some people, I'm afraid, um, do have to think that. And there was a point in my life where I had to think a bit harder, but um, not, uh, not anymore. So your second question, I think, is about what we might do about it. And for those who don't know, there's an um, associate professor, uh, Arun Advani, in our department, a very talented man who's um, prominent in the media and really making a difference, I think, to policy making. And he argues for a wealth tax. Now, inequality of wealth is clearly, if you just think about it arithmetically, where the big bucks are, right? That is where the really big bucks are. I don't know what um, Mr. Zuckerberg pays himself per year, but I don't suppose he's too bothered really about what he pays. He's got 120 billion. So it's um, off and on through my life. I don't think you and I, this is the chair of economics for those who don't know, um, off and on I've been keen on the idea of a wealth tax. And then I think about how difficult it is, partly to get through the citizens. I mean, we can't even get people to pay tax on their completely illicit capital gains on their home ownership, can we? We can't even do that. People make £200,000 capital gain with no work whatsoever, and they think they should have it all without tax. So I'm, I think that is going to be difficult. and I know Arun thinks that. Um, Ideally, I would, I'd pursue that if I could. I don't know how to make it practicable. Um, from the very first, I've been interested in this topic for about 30 years. It seemed to me best not to ask people about why they felt this or felt that. Instead, I took a kind of econometrician's approach, if you understand me, a kind of statistician's approach. I thought, let's take the answers that they give about how happy they feel or their job or whatever it is, and I'll measure lots of other things about them. Then I'll try to work out what those things are doing to their happiness. You probably know you're supposed to eat at least five fruits and vegetables a day. I would advise you to eat eight on, some of, on the basis of some of my research. But, of course, asking people how many bits of fruit and veg do you think you should eat before that research had been done? They wouldn't know how to reply. It's the statistical analysis on the data that has shown, I think slightly erroneously, but shown um, five a day is good. Do you, I, I'm hoping I'm making sense here. So we're trying to understand what we see statistically as the determinants, that a lot of individuals in their own lives, because they can't by definition see the huge patterns, we're trying to understand the huge patterns. We can't explain your happiness, your mental health. We can't explain the atoms. We're just looking at the overall pattern. Well, I could, I'd never close my mind to that, the, the idea that there's one deep uh, driving variable, but I think that would be surprising. I mean, climate change seems uh, quite independent as a system to almost everything else. Infectious diseases might be linked, we don't know that, might well be linked to the rising average temperature, and the, the kind of mental health scores. Well, I haven't talked about it today, but if you remember on the so-called BRFSS graphs, the ones I began with, um, detailed analysis shows a lot of that goes down to the group of people who can't find work or are pessimistic if they lose their job about ever working again. So that sounds to me like another somewhat independent factor from a bunch of the others. The, the only other thing to say is, of course, this is a public lecture, right? I, can, I, can, I haven't run equations, and I wouldn't know how to, um, putting different weights on those different things. I wouldn't approach that intellectually in that way, and probably you wouldn't either. But I think in a public lecture, I'm allowed some photographs and stuff, and I can say things that I'm not allowed to say in my formal lectures, just to explain that to the registrar of the university. <laughs> It would need another lecture to do social media properly, but, and a lot of people, of course, are keen to believe that social media is very bad. And you may have heard of a 
really quite a talented guy called Haidt, H-A-I-D-T, Jonathan, I think it is. I didn't meet him once or twice. Who's released a book which, of, of course, will sell enormously. And he was on the Today program saying how terrible smartphones are. And I could imagine two million middle class parents all being very pleased to hear that. Um, my weighing of the scientific evidence for what it's worth is that we do not know that net social media is bad. We can certainly find some bad aspects and some terrible things that have happened. There's also a positive side to social media. Very large numbers of young people, especially now, uh, communicate a great deal and get a lot of friendship support that way. In a sense that I never did, of course, in my generation. So you will, you will hear lots of researchers say social media is a bad thing. But if you want to look up the, uh, what's it called, you know, the book review of Jonathan Haidt's book in Nature by a very talented woman, came out just recently, look up that book review, and she more or less says, just throw this book away. It, there's not enough scientific content. Now that doesn't make Haidt wrong, it just means that going on the Today programme, saying on the basis of some little spiky graphs, because that's what it boiled down to, that social media are, ba are bad, is bad, um, that's not good enough for real researchers. If, I, if you ask me which way is the evidence going, I would say the evidence is tilting in the negative direction. But we're not there yet, in my opinion. I'm supposed to be a social scientist, I don't know how to answer that. I mean, I think politicians are ridiculously underpaid. Partly that's because of Mrs. Thatcher. Um, we should be paying them exceptionally high salaries and that would then reduce the incentives for corruption, start to get people in who weren't born with hereditary wealth or got their money in all sorts of other unsavory, well to me unsavory ways, and so on. So hugely increasing the pay of politicians I think would be a good idea. Then we'd have real competition with exceptionally talented people. Um, beyond that I wish I had something more interesting to say. I mean, the fact of the matter is that we elected Boris Johnson. I mean, everybody must have known exactly what sort of person he was. Donald Trump was ele elected. He's been transparently the same ever since he was elected. People must have known what they're getting. So, presumably that's what they wanted. And then that's very difficult to alter. Um, well, I think that's extremely sensible, um, very clearly put, and I agree with you. The one thing I'd say is that that's been going on for centuries. I mean, it's, it's routine that people see technical change, even including AI, and think we've never been through anything like this. Um, but there's a reason why we don't make cartwheels anymore and, and so on. So, yes, new technology is deeply disru disruptive by its nature, but... Um, we've lived those, through those things. Think about computing alone many times. So I, I don't think that can be a very deep continuing trend that lies behind this, but it's certainly part of the initial stuff and the, the early graphs from the American Journal of Public Health that I showed you um, helped us pinpoint the, um, the Americans who'd lost their jobs in manufacturing and were exceptionally dissatisfied, the, the, the Trump voters. So that was a, pa a potent force at that time in many parts of the US. Uh, thank you again for coming, and I think we're done.